Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, we're very glad to see you here today. Take time out of your busy day. And uh, I'm Phil Dubois, the chancellor, and uh, at least temporarily, uh, temporarily so, your master of ceremonies. Uh, we have many special people here tonight, to, uh, today, too many to mention individually, except just a few. Uh, my predecessor, Chancellor Jim Woodward, the third chancellor. Welcome, Jim. Uh, out of the interest of job security, I should mention I have three trustees here. Uh, my board chair, Joe Price, uh, Kathy Bassan, a trustee who you'll meet in a minute, and, and Teresa Drew, thank you for being here. And uh, although he could have fired me when he had the chance, Gene Johnson, our former chair of our board of trustees, uh, then chair of our foundation board, and now chair of the um, exponential campaign, Gene, thank you and Vicki for being here. <laughs> And I've, it's good to see in the front row Mr. Hugh McCall, and I have a story about Mr. McCall in just a second. Uh, it's fitting that we gather here in Center City looking out upon the beautiful downtown and, of course, the Bank of America uh, structure that, that Hugh built. And uh, this is a day to celebrate our longstanding uh, partnership with Bank of America. I'm going to go a little off script to tell you that story about Hugh McCall. Uh, several years ago, when uh, alumni encouraged me to look at the starting of a football team. I decided I better make some soundings in the community. And of course that meant, in the case of Bank of America, that I should talk to Hugh McCall. And I went to see Hugh in his office and I explained that I was thinking about a football program and he kind of leaned back and he, I said, what do you think? He says, well, Phil, it would be, it'd be good for the community. And he said, it would be good for the university. And I said, well, would you give any money for it? And he said, not a dime. Uh, <laughs> Well, the fact that we now have McCall Richardson Field <laughs> in Jerry Richardson Stadium tells you that Hugh uh, thought better of it and gave very generously to UNC Charlotte. Uh, the engagement of UNC Charlotte with the Bank of America long predates football, uh, beginning in 1968 with North Carolina National Bank and continuing with Nations Bank and then the Bank of America. This de dedicated corporate citizen has been an ally to us in so many ways, with volunteer participation on campus boards and the Board of Trustees, endowed professorships, and the Bank of America Award for Teaching Excellence, which has been in existence for nearly 50 years. And most recently, support for the creation and implementation of the Applied Technology Program. The Applied Technology Program, is, or as we call it, ATP, is a true win-win partnership for both the university and the bank. Uh, it gives undergraduate students from the College of Computing and Informatics and the Belt College of Business the opportunity to gain invaluable work exp experience and provides the bank with an opportunity to look at potential future employees. In the last two years, in fact, 100% of the students who progressed through the ATP program were, were hired on as permanent employees at the Bank of America, which is caused them to shift their allegiance and make wardrobe accommodations to go from green and white to red and blue. <laughs> and we have several of our uh, students here who have gone through that program. Today I'm happy to announce that the Bank of America is once again expanding its partnership with the university through a $1.5 million gift to Exponential, the campaign for UNC Charlotte. This gift establishes an endowed fund supporting the data science initiative and creates an endowed chair in security analytics, which will help position the university at the center of the data analytics revolution. The endowed chair position is so important to strengthening the leadership and support of UNC Charlotte and the Charlotte region within the North Carolina data science initiative. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the recent passing of Bill Rabarsky. Bill was the Bank of America Endowed Chair in Information Technology at the university from 2004 to 2015 when he retired. He was also the founding director of the Charlotte Visualization Center. He was a great scholar, colleague, mentor, and teacher. And it goes without saying that his career at UNC Charlotte exemplified the catalytic effect that an endowed professorship or an endowed chair can have at a young and aspiring research university. 
beyond the endowed chair, this gift from the bank will dedicate or support our Charlotte Civic Series initiatives presented by the Bank of America, including three marquee lectures, the Chancellor's Speaker Series, the Barnhart Seminar on Ethics, and the TIAA Lecture. Uh, Ban Bank of America is a steadfast partner with us, and we're privileged to have its vested interest in our faculty and students. And as uh, Charles noted out front, we now have the permanently named the central event space in this building, the Bank of America Atrium. And thank you to Charles for helping to make that possible, and of course to Kathy as well. As part of our celebration today, we're honored to have Kathy Bassant, the bank's chief operations and technology officer, and one of my trustees here to lead a discussion with a noted author, anthropologist, and UNC Charlotte faculty member, Kathy Reichs. Kathy, uh, who's been a trustee for the last four years, has long been a leader in business and civic life in Charlotte. She's been with the bank for more than 30 years, when she started as a child, um, and, <laughs> and a very young member of the ATP program at that time. She now leads the technology and operations of the bank across the company, and that, of course, means across the world. She's had a dynamic impact in economic development, education, philanthropy, and the arts across our region and beyond, and she recently was named chairperson of the North Tryon Vision Plan Advisory Committee, which will help develop that most important part of town. For this and many other business and civic contributions over the years, she was recently honored by, by excuse me, by being named with the North Carolina Order of the Longleaf Pine. And later this week, she will receive the Woman of the Year Lifetime Achievement Award from the Charlotte Business Journal. We're also lucky to have with us today Kathy Reichs. She started her distinguished career as a professor in our Department of Anthropology. And she is one of fewer than 100 forensic anthropologists ever certified by the American Board of Forensic Anthropology. She took her professional expertise and experience as a forensic anthropologist to build a, a second career as an author of forensic thrillers and producer of a major television series. Her first novel, Deja Dead, catapulted her to fame when it became a New York Times bestseller and won her the 1997 Ellis Award for Best First Novel. Now, of course, at that time, Jim Woodward was chancellor and I was his provost, and it only took about Kathy having two successful books for us to figure out that she needed to be writing full time. So we had the smarts to give her a leave so she could go to that career, and that's one of the reasons in every Kathy Reich's book, she says something nice about the chancellor. Um, <laughs> she's also co-authored the Virals Young Adult series with her son, Brendan. The series follows the adventure in adventures of Temperance Brennan's great niece, Tori Brennan. Uh, she's also a producer, as I mentioned, of a hit TV Fox series, Bones, and that's based on all of her written works and novels and some original screenplays as well. She traveled to Rwanda to testify at the UN Tribunal on Genocide. She helped exhume a mass grave in Guatemala. Her professional experience took her in the background of the Kaylee Anthony, Anthony case and she assisted with identifying remains after the 2001 terrorist bombing at the World Trade Center. We're excited to have these two impressive women with us today, and so I'm gonna ask Kathy Bassant to take the podium first, and welcome. Thank you, Phil. Apparently, Kathy and I haven't taught you the trick. Kathy with a C, Kathy with a K. No need for last names <laughs> in the Kathy business. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. I was struck uh, when I was in the, the atrium that this is not really um, a gathering of disconnected people or disinterested people that happen to attend the same um, discussion. This is a room full of family. I look around and I see former trustees, I see people who've built Charlotte, I see people who care about Charlotte today, care about the university, um, care about um, great writing and, and great philanthropy, and I'm just thrilled, actually thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I too will offer my welcome to Hugh McCall. I always get a little territorial, Phil. Nobody gets to introduce my Phil McCall but me, or my <laughs> Hugh McCall but me. Um, but I do have to remind him, since um, uh, we're not often in public together, that I still have in my desk, Hugh, an official Hugh McCall get out of jail free card. Um, uh, upon which there is no expiration date, <laughs> and which at the right time I will absolutely, most certainly use. Uh, a couple of things about why today's gift is important, and I'm not going to stand up here long because we really want to hear from Kathy with a K. Three things. First, um, 
creating an atrium and naming an atrium may seem to be just another corporate naming opportunity. That isn't what this is. This is about convocation, little c. Um, it's, about, it's about bringing people together. You can't tour a university that's been built in contemporary times and not realize that today's university students are all about open space. They're all about coming together. Me, give me my library carol to study for finals and not see another soul, but not today. And so the atrium is not accidental. It's about creating community and creating space and bringing people together to have important discussions as we build minds and we build um, our leaders for the future. As for science and technology and security and the, and the support of the program and the endowed um, uh, chair role, what could be more important than supporting technology and building minds that know, will know the intersection between <coughs> great technology and ethics and the responsible use over many, many years of that technology. Nothing could be more important. And the only thing, Phil, I would correct that you said is that University of North Carolina at Charlotte is already a leader in this space. I, I say all the time at the bank that if we weren't sitting five or six miles away from each other physically, we would be working together even if we were around the world because the expertise and the faculty and the administration focus on this and the, uh, the, uh, the amount of talent the university um, has amassed is just unbelievable. Really show-stoppingly great and worthy of our attention. And then, of course, the series, um, the discussion on ethics. I, I refuse to call it the lecture series. It just gives me the heebie-jeebies from, um, from you know, my early marketing classes with 400 students in them. But, um, but it is about a speaker series and a set of conversations designed to inspire thought designed to cause you to think about something differently after you came into the rooms that you'll be in than you did before you came into the rooms that you'll be in, or, or to give you one ounce, one sentence of inspiration that causes you to look at the world in a new way or to bring perspective to something you've been struggling with. So these, again, nothing accidental, thoughtful use of our shareholders' resources um, to support great work and great civic leadership. And I can't tell you how proud I am to be a part of it. Um, the speaker series is about people of substance. And I think today, what could be better than to have Kathy Reichs because speaker of substance or person of substance in the dictionary, Kathy Reichs right next to it. Phil, you did a great job of the credentials, accomplished um, forensic anthropologist, and I like to think of it as scientist, accomplished scientist accomplished author, um, mo maybe most importantly for those of us who try to do it all, an incredibly accomplished mother and grandmother. And I've been excited to meet the middle child, Courtney, who we may hear, uh, I may ask Kathy to talk about in, in just a minute. As Phil said, she's written 19 novels. They've been translated for global, or for those of you who are global, into over 30 languages. Um, when the series Bones completes at the end of its 12th season, I think I have the numbers right, there will be, have been 245 episodes. Think about that. Um, and that happens to be more episodes than there are bones in the human body. So the only element, the only element of this, and there's one person in the room who cannot answer, the only element of this that looks like a lecture is the Socratic method. So someone tell me how many bones are there in the human body? Who said it? And it can't be anyone who read my briefing. <laughs> Did, who, you said it? Okay, 206, great job. And that's right, right, Kathy? Okay. <laughs> if you break one, maybe you have 207. It just, it, it works. <laughs> All right, um, now, we're gonna try to have a fun, fun conversation, a little bit of seriousness, because I think we should get to the essence of who this brilliant woman is. And then we're gonna throw the dialogue open for your questions, so I'm hoping that you'll participate with us in the Convocation of Learning. Kathy, if you'll join me on stage. Kathy Reichs. I asked someone in my office today for a new clipboard that was subtle. <laughs> so, here we are. You know, I had a million things that I wanted to open with Kathy. First of all, thank you for being here. 
Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. You do such a credit to the university and, and to this area. When I asked Kathy, when I came in, I said, oh, did you have to, how did you come in this morning? Because she does have two or three places that she can perch. And she said, oh, you mean from my home? <laughs> I said, oh, yes, good. <laughs> um, all right, so, but I heard so many great things in the atrium. So start with a little bit more on the story that Phil started to tell. How did it really all happen? Is, are the rumors true? Did your daughter really submit your manuscript without, uh, your first manuscript for Days of Dead without you knowing it? Oh, no, it was okay. collaborative. We worked <laughs> together. She was dating someone who knew someone who knew someone who worked at a publishing house because I had no idea how to get commercial fiction published. It, it's, it's quite different than doing a textbook or a scientific book. So I said, we'll find out you know, what publisher and what does this person do? Do they work in the donut shop? Or, you know, I, anyway, it turned out um, the friend's 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 friend was a junior editor at Scribner. So I thought, okay. That's, and so we sat down and we wrote a letter and we put it on the manuscript and we just mailed it off, which is ridiculous. It's a terrible, terrible way to try to get published. And undoubtedly on the other end, my friend's 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 been told that her friend's 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 mother's first novel is coming her way. <laughs> <laughs> so she told me later that she took the manuscript, she took two or three chapters home with her that weekend from Manhattan to her apartment, already composing the reject letter in her mind. And uh, she read them, she got back in her car, she went back into Manhattan, she got the rest of the manuscript, went back home, handed it up to the proper editor, and I think I had an offer within 10 days. So it's not the way to go about getting published, but it did work. Well, the talent comes through, clearly. Uh, you know, I do want to start where you started, which is as a scientist and as as an anthropologist, ultimately a forensic anthropologist. Um, it's just a little bit like being a banker. Forensic anthropologist, probably not on the top 10 list of careers to consider for, for <laughs> middle schoolers. Uh, but <laughs> banker doesn't qualify either, all of you people who are <laughs> laughing. Um, and in fact, I'm not so certain I understood it as to be a field until I started watching some things burning on TV. And you have inspired, as Phil says, so many many young people um, to, and, and in many ways, have built a professional class of forensic anthropologists. Well, I, when I wrote the book, I don't think anyone had heard of forensic anthropology. Now, I can't tell you how many emails and contacts I get from middle schoolers or high schoolers or university undergrads saying, I want to be a forensic anthropologist. How do I go about it? What do I do? And programs have opened in universities that didn't exist before. So. Yeah, I think uh, there's a greater awareness of all the forensic sciences, but anthropology is, is right in there at the head of the pack. Yeah, very much. Uh, but for you personally, how did it get started? M which part? The right the forensic anthrop anthropologist part. Oh, uh, I trained to do bioarchaeology. I was very happily doing bioarchaeology. The paleopathology and paleoepidemiology of two lower Illinois River Valley populations. Has anyone read? That? <laughs> that was my PhD dissertation. <laughs> my mother read it. But, um, <laughs> so I was, that's where my focus was. But police started bringing cases to me. And I, re I can remember the very first case that I was asked to work on here in Charlotte. And to, I love archaeology, it's fascinating. But if you're wrong or right, you're going to get into debates with your colleagues in the literature and you're not going to impact anyone's life. Whereas with forensic anthropology, when you identify a missing family member or you testify in court, you have to be right because you are going to impact someone's life. So I really like that relevance. And I retrained and became board certified and that was the beginning of it. And so, so you like the relevance of it. What else? What, what, at what moment did you say, this is my career, and I'm going to build it this way, and, and I love it? What is the passion behind it? Well, I think it stemmed from that, from that very, the gratification of being able to give answers, to solve puzzles, and also a little bit perhaps the excitement of being in the center of what's going on. You, people are reading about you know, a missing child who's been found and identified in the news and on TV, and, and you're actually there. You're actually 
helping with that. I don't do anything by myself. I'm part of a team. But to be part of that team and to be able to do that, to me, that was right from the beginning was very compelling. Is there anything you don't like about it? There's a type of maggot. They're called cheese skippers. <laughs> and uh, they jump. So while you're working, they're jumping all over the place, onto the floor, onto the So I don't like cheese skippers. <laughs> As of today, neither do I. <laughs> so let's go back even further. <laughs> this is frightening now, uh, but let's go back even further. Childhood influences. What you, your childhood influences? Oh, Nancy Drew. Love it. Me too. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I was always attracted to um, being outside, being nature, to collecting spiders, collecting snakes, collecting frogs, that sort of thing, rather than playing with dolls or being in the house. Going off into the woods, we'd go on what we'd call bike hikes and go off into, I, I grew up partly in Minnesota, so there was a lot of woodland and, yeah, so I think forensic anthropology brings together the mystery, the puzzle solving, but also the biological science aspect of it and the humanity aspect of it that you are trying to, to help families and, and give them answers. So I like all of that mixed up together. And recognizing that at the time, particularly, that was probably a little bit different than, um, than the way most people grew up um, from a very young age. Did the people around you encourage you? Did they discourage you? Did they try to channel you? Well, my mother was a strong influence. She strongly encouraged me to go into science, interestingly, way back then. Um, I ignored her, and I did about four different undergraduate majors before I stumbled on biological anthropology. But um, I, you know, no one discouraged me. I was just grew up in an environment that I could experiment with. What I, I actually had a chemistry lab that I set up in the basement. We had this old farmhouse we lived in, and there was this room I was given. And we set up a, a lab down there when I was eight. There is a great, one of my favorite Bones episodes is the one where Temperance goes back to her college reunion. You know, that's... Or high school reunion. High school reunion. Yes, it's funny because I just flew in from Dubai on uh, Thursday and when I got on the last leg from JFK to here on the little screen on the seat in front of me, Bones was playing and it was that episode. Really? Yeah. <laughs> See, community, connection. <laughs> But what I was struck by in that episode is how um, lonely she must have been growing up in the way that that episode portrayed her, her early years and the importance of role models and some of her teachers and those kinds of things. Did you feel separate from the other kids? Um, not really. I just, uh, I think you find your group, whatever it is, and wherever, if, whether you're an undergraduate or, you know, whether you're in fourth grade, you find your group that you're compatible with, and I just hung out with the frog collectors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, you, so you, become, you are a very successful foren forensic anthropologist, both uh, as an academic and, and in the teaching world, but also solving cases. And then fiction comes along. You know, uh, honestly, I think about it all the time. It's a little bit like trying to be a professional executive with a pink clipboard, honestly, or, or uh, you know, there are, there are things where you're trying to be pursue a very serious, rigorous, academic, um, scientific profession, and then fiction comes in. Is that a dichotomy? How did people react? How did people react? Um, I didn't tell anybody I was writing fiction. I think if you write a novel in the English department, you're a hero. But if you write a novel and you're supposed to be a scientist, you're a little bit suspect. Right. So I didn't, uh, I didn't talk about it at all until I actually had landed a publishing uh, contract. And then you know, I remember going in and telling the department chair at that time that I've written this little book and I've sold this little book. And um, uh, it's hard to say the reaction because I had to worry both about the reaction among my colleagues here at UNCC in academia and the reaction of my colleagues in the forensic lab in Montreal um, upon whom I drew rather blatantly in many cases. So it was, you know, how are they going to feel about this when they see themselves thinly veiled in the story? <laughs> and it was like uh, uh, Thomas, who's, who, was it Thomas Wolfe, Thomas Hardy, who wrote uh, Look Homeward Angel? 
I was confused. Wolf. Wolf. Yeah, Thomas Wolf. Um, and he said when he went back to Asheville, he was nervous about the people he used in the story, but the only people that were annoyed were the people that weren't in the story. <laughs> so I kind of got that reaction at the lab, like, you know, what's wrong with me? Why didn't, why didn't you put me in the book? Which comes more naturally, naturally to you? Or are they both the same thing, science and puzzle, puzzle solving and storytelling? Um, well, they're similar in some ways, but they're very different also. Um, you start with a premise, a hypothesis, a premise, and then you spin it off into, well, what if this, what if that, what if that? And you're testing all along the way in science. In writing fiction, you don't really have to do that. You just, you can do, I remember writing the first book and I'd pause having written scientific articles and books and I'd think, well, can I say that? And then I think, well, yeah, I can say whatever I want. This is fiction, you know, and on, on you go. So that was very liberating to be able to do that. I know you don't believe in writer's block, but talk a little bit about your writing process. What happens when you have that moment where the next word doesn't come or where, where you don't know the next move you need to make? Um, you power through. Um, you may not, whatever you write, I don't believe in permitting writer's block to, to stop you from writing. There are times when it's not, not coming. Every day, you know, is, is not creatively brilliant. But you go ahead and you write. You still control the delete key. So the next day, if you look at it and it's terrible, you can just get rid of it. But I think if you start allowing yourself to say, well, the muses are not with me today. I'm going to take the day off. It's a bad day. You, that's just a slippery slope. Um, especially, I may have that mindset because when I began writing, I was also teaching full time and you know, commuting, doing the forensic work as well. So to find those blocks of time when I could write, I had to write during those blocks of times. I didn't have the luxury of, of not writing. And what's, just so everybody here knows, um, what's your preferred, or in, even in the early days, what was your preferred mode of writing? Pen and paper? Oh no, I can't imagine writing <laughs> on pen and paper. Um, <laughs> I can't even imagine writing on a typewriter. Um, I write at the computer. I remember one time P.D. James, I was pr privileged to become a good friend of hers, and one time Phyllis said to me, I write on a typewriter and I give it to a young man who puts it on something called a disc. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I don't do it that way. I write directly on the computer. I do, I, I write differently if I'm writing a screenplay for the show, for a TV episode versus writing a novel. Um, I do some outlining for the novel, but it's much more of a free flow process. I don't outline the entire book. Whereas when you're writing for television, it's much more structured. You have a lot more bosses to answer to, so that you have to uh, do it in very specific stages. Do you relate that at all to innovation and to puzzle solving itself? When, when we talk about innovation, it, it has to be about a process. The outcome is important, but repeatable, reliable process, I believe, produces a great outcome. You've talked a little bit about that. I, well, for me, I'm a very linear thinker and a very linear writer, so um, I do have a very predictable process that I follow to create a book. My daughter will wake up and if she's in a gloomy mood, she will write, this is my um, older daughter, not my middle daughter who's sitting here, um, she'll write the death scene. And if she's in a happy mood, she'll write the love scene. But that's just so wrong. I can't do that. <laughs> I write chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four until I'm at the end of the story. Now, it's a feedback process. It's linear in that, but it's a feedback as well in that as I'm going and I come across something I hadn't thought about and I like it, uh, I work it in and I may have to go back and change things, but it is a feedback process also. So I hope everybody's out there um, thinking about your questions. We're going to come to you in just a, just a few minutes. Switching to um, a more serious uh, set of topics, you have worked, as Phil mentioned, I think, really well, you have worked in some really important and difficult situations, some highly public, um, some completely devastating, uh, no more poignant um, or important than your work at Ground Zero. Can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that was tough. Um, I, w I went there with what's called DMORT, which is Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Teams. It's a network of ex uh, permanent teams uh, that break down the same as FEMA districts. So we're in a district that includes the southeastern part of the country. They're activated only in situations of mass fatality, such as uh, 
Hurricane Katrina or remember this genius in Georgia who instead of cremating the bodies, he just stacked 300 bodies in the back of his property. Our DMORT team sorted that out. And then, of course, commercial airline disasters. So um, normally you would only work within your own region, but 9-11 was so massive. And in the early days, people couldn't get there. You couldn't rent a car. You couldn't fly, obviously. So they just brought in anybody that, that could get to New York City. So I was the second wave that went in. It was mostly, it was almost entirely a recovery. It wasn't an identification um, because everything was so fragmentary. So we just spent 13 hour shifts every day um, digging through rubble and my main job was to identify if it was human because there were a lot of restaurants, catering services and things in the Twin Towers. So there was a lot of animal bones. So determining if it's human, um, giving it a medical examiner number, bagging it, tagging it, and then the ME van would come each day and pick up whatever remains we had discovered. And how do you go back day two, day three, day four? You just do it. It's like writer's block. You don't have a choice. You do it. And everyone was there. The, the amount of first responders that we were, you know, everyone was, everybody in America was fragile. And everybody wanted to do something to help to donate blood or donate sneakers or whatever. So I think I was fortunate in a sense in that I could actually get in there and actually physically dig through that debris and do something. So in that, in that sense, we were lucky in any way. I'm sure everyone asks you about the famous one, um, Ground Zero being an example. Are there experiences that you've had um, in the forensic anthropologist side of your life that people don't know about that are important that or that have a message or are important to you? Well, there are many cases I don't, I don't talk about cases um, publicly, usually. If, if it's out there, it's in the news media or it's out there already in a, a courtroom transcripts and testimonies, public knowledge in other words. I will use bits and pieces of cases to, use, to create my stories. Sure. And then I spin off, I start with that little nugget and then I spin it off into, into fiction kind of like writing your resume, you know, you start with that little nugget. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know if I answered that question or not. You did, you did. I'm looking at my current employee, former student body president, and my new employee, uh, former student body president for UNC Charlotte. I'm going to reread those resumes, guys. <laughs> okay. Um, so you've created, uh, as we talked about earlier, you've created almost single-handedly, honestly, no, no, um, no, um, um, no exponential thinking aside, or all exponential thinking aside, you, you've created um, an entire generation of people who understand what you do and many of which want to be it. Talk a little bit about your view of STEM education. How well are we preparing people to do what you do? Are there things that you think about in the, in the science and engineering and math disciplines? Well, I, I can only speak for my own discipline. I can't speak for how sure. well uh, mathematics is, or engineering is being taught. But one of the reasons my son and I did the young adult um, series, the Tory Brennan series, is that we wanted to create um, a strong female heroine, uh, a, a young girl, and someone who was unapologetically interested in science and in STEM type subjects and hopefully that that would create a role model for young girls that yeah, it's a, it's a good idea, it's, it's okay, it's better than okay to go into STEM subjects. So hopefully we were able to do a l our little bit of contribution to that. Do you feel like the U you've worked um, all over the world, do you feel like the U.S. is competitive in our training for people who want to pursue science? Gosh, it's, again, it's hard for me to speculate about or to, to comment on other areas than my own. I think we do an excellent job of, of educating forensic scientists. And the forensic sciences have come under a lot of scrutiny in the last decade. So we've really had to address some shortcomings and some issues. One of the problems that developed in the forensic sciences is because of probably because of books like mine and the TV show, is that all of a sudden the forensic sciences became hot. We became sexy and everybody wanted to be a forensic scientist. And people with a degree in chemistry or psychology or anthropology suddenly hung out their shingle and said, I'm a forensic this or I'm a forensic that. And the courts, law enforcement, 
attorneys were left with this, well, how do I know who's a legitimate expert? How do we know who to allow to give expert testimony or who do we hire to do our expertise? And that is why board certification came about. Almost all the forensic science fields now have this process of board certification. And I think that's important in, in weeding out you know, who the legitimate experts are. How has technology changed your work? Gosh, you know, when journalists come to my lab, they're often disappointed at how low tech my lab is. Now, I have other, you know, I can walk up the corridor and, and use a scanning electron microscope or a gas chromatographer, but in my field, I use um, x-rays, of course, and I use um, uh, microscopes, and I, you know, I'll use an autopsy saw, but metric measuring equipment, that I don't use a whole lot of really jazzy technology, sadly. I'd like one of those Angelitrons, you know? Yeah. I mean, she is really good with she that She is thing. really good, yeah. yes, yeah. I'm, I'm now, I've always called it the Angelitron, so I like Angelitron. I'm going with the producer well, of the shows. Know, in, in the early <laughs> seasons, we called it the Angelator, and then somehow I don't remember where around season three or so it became the Angelitron, so. It's great. Have you ever seen it work? Who's seen it work? Okay, it's really important. It's really important. Simulation, virtualization, visualization, yeah. that's all. We've, we've already talked about it. It's all, all right there. Um, let's talk about virals for a second. I, uh, Mr. McCall will tell you that I'm really not very good at co-anything. <laughs> um, it's a development need. And, um, <laughs> but yet, you do something very difficult. You are co-writing and, and co-authoring uh, with someone you're related to. In two situations. Um, I co-wrote the viral series with my son, Brendan, who is a litigator. So you can imagine our editorial meetings <laughs> when we discussed our creative differences. And I co-write episodes for the show, for Bones, with my oldest daughter, who um, is also an attorney. So yes, I've collaborated with two of my, my normal daughter is here with me today. The other two, <laughs> the other two are, are not here today. But, um, but is, is that hard? Is, are, what happens when there are creative differences? It, well, as Brendan would say, I w we would each do our different parts because he's better at some things, I'm better at some. We'd then put the manuscript together and then I would do what he would call destroy his art. <laughs> I would go through with the red pen and edit it. <laughs> and then we would get to get together and close the office door and discuss those changes. It's easier when you're writing for television to co-write because writing for television, when I write a novel, it's the classic image of the author all alone, by myself, at my computer, banging it out. When you write for television, you do it collectively. You do what's called breaking the story. You go into the writer's room, and with the other staff writers, you actually, when you go in, the walls are covered with these terrifyingly empty white boards, erasable boards, and for our show, they're divided into six acts. And for anywhere from one to three weeks, you break the story, which means you hammer out the outline of your entire episode, your A story, your B story, your C story. So by the end of the week, the boards are full. You then have to pitch that to the executive producers. That has to be approved. You then are sent to write an outline, which is a 10 to 15 page single spaced outline. It's a big honking document. That has to be pitched. Then when that's approved, you actually write the script. And then you turn it in, you're done, and they change everything. <laughs> so it's, it's easier, I think, to work with a co-author in that context than it was to work with a co-author writing the, the young adult series. And Courtney, is it, you're a nurse, is that what you, yeah? So a scientist in your own right, in a way, the science of people. Um, uh, when, you've got, when you've got children that put, some participate in the family business and, uh, uh, Courtney has a slightly different path. How does that all work? Well, you know, it used to be Courtney and me against the world <laughs> because their dad is an attorney, Carrie's an attorney, Brendan's an attorney. Courtney and I would look at each other at dinner and go, dear God, for the rest of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> and then the two attorney kids left the dark side, came over, they decided to become writers instead. So, um, yeah, it's, it was a shifting dynamic. I should also point out that Paul Reichs is in the front row of the audience um, with us today. So uh, 
So I'm sure Paul's enjoying the commentary. And you can tell us uh, later on what's, what's true <laughs> about what's going on at home. All right, um, I am going to open up our discussion to the audience. I've got a, like four more pages of questions, so don't, don't let me down. I'm happy to ask them. But uh, um, uh, Shai, why don't you start? Don't say the year, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, Your class was, was riveting, um, and no one seemed to stray from the discussion. It was great. Um, I would like to thank you both, though, because I'm a father of an 11-year-old little girl who also knows both your names. Um, I've used both of you as people I've met in my life to help demonstrate to her that she can be anything she wants. Um, so I'd like to thank you both for being such an extraordinary example for all of us that have little girls. Right here. Right next to Mitch. Hi, my name is Julie Cross. I'm currently an intern um, at the Applied Technology Program. And you seem very passionate about what you do, and that's really exciting. So my question for you is, what is your biggest piece of advice for any of the young professionals or even elder professionals about like chasing your dreams or doing what you're passionate about? Do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Try it. If you don't, give a shot. You know, if you want to write that novel or whatever it is, just do it. Uh, you can't just talk about it and think about it, but, you know, find that little block of time, whatever you want to become a, you know, I don't know, better tennis player, novelist, whatever, and, and work at it and, and make it happen. I think we're actually getting one of our important um, takeaways of substance, which is, uh, if we could paraphrase several of the things you've said, just do it, um, get up in the morning because you have to and, and get to work, power through the, the blocked moment. I mean, you, you, you get the sense of, of purpose and, and what that means. How about somebody up, up here where it's a little tougher for me to see? R right here. Hey, thank you both. Um, I'm Megan Stamper and actually run the Applied Technology Program, so we appreciate all of the support, Kathy, from you and Kathy with a K from you for UNC Charlotte as well. Um, Kathy with a C, this is actually a question for you. I'm sure you have a lot of spare time. And I'm um, <laughs> just curious in that. You've got amazing stories that I've, I've heard at multiple opportuni opportunities. Um, have you ever thought about writing uh, fiction or nonfiction yourself? <laughs> There's at least one person in the front row who's quaking in his boots. <laughs> and, uh, and there are probably several, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, Actually, I, I think about it sometimes. I um, don't keep notes for any particular purpose. I do know that what I would want to write about is my own experience, and I would rather write about the people that I care about and love after it matters less to them um, uh, to see themselves in writing. So maybe someday, um, but right now I'm, I'm got all I can do, and I just live it. And if you saw my closet, you would know that I, that I have other things to do first. <laughs> Right here. Hi, um, I'm Isis Perry. Unfortunately, I'm not a part of UNC Charlotte or Bank of America. I'm with Carolina's healthcare system. But this is a quick question. What's the difference between writing the first book versus the second versus the 19th? Between writing a first book versus a second book? Or the 19th. Or the 19th. Um, well, the first book, you're creating everything brand new. So you can make up whatever you want. In fact, the book I have coming out in July is an off-series book. It's a brand new character, brand new setting, brand new premise. And that was really fun after having done 18 Temperance Brennan books. So it gets, it get, it gets a little harder. It's easier when you're doing a series character because you know who your, character, who your core of characters, what your core of characters is. But it gets harder because you've got to reintroduce that core premise, that core set of characters in every single book. 
for your new readers if they pick up book 16 and it's the first one. But you don't want to bore those who have read multiple of your books. So you have to come up constantly with new and creative ways to do that, to reintroduce your character and your premise. So there's a real challenge to that if you're doing a series, um, a series character. There's also the problem, what do you do about aging your character? Temperance Brennan, when the first book came out, was eh, north of 40. I was a little vague, but we knew that. She'd seen 40, her 40th birthday come and go. Um, in the 18th book, she's eh, north of 40. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cat is 37, but you know, she's, she's, so those are decisions you have to consciously make. Are you going to age your characters? Or, it's, it's fair to do it either way. Some writers do that, and some just keep them kind of uh, holding in that same age pattern. Well, and of course, television doesn't allow that. You've had to age characters. We have had to age characters, and one of the things I was a little nervous about when I first um, agreed to Fox, because Fox skews, it's a, it's a younger market. It's not CBS. So um, when we cast uh, Emily Deschanel at age 29 to play this board-certified forensic anthropologist with all of this experience, I thought, wow, that's really pushing the lower limit. But now that Emily's finally, thank God, in her 40s, um, you know, it's a good thing that we did because our characters have aged over the, we're the longest running scripted drama in the history of Fox. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Other questions? Right this here. will all be on the exam. Yeah. So. <laughs> 206, remember that. <laughs> so this is a question for both Kathy's. Um, so in, you guys have had a lot of experiences. Now in the perspective of a woman, what are some of the you know, obstacles that you faced and how have you overcome them? And for, for both of you guys. Oh, that's, you know, I'm often asked that, and I honestly don't recall ever having been discriminated against because of my gender. Um, I think there may have been some salary issues in my early years <laughs> that might have been affected by gender. Um, but I don't, you know, academia is a little different than uh, certain other uh, arenas, I think. It's a little more fair to women. When I look, I was once asked how many, what's the ratio in forensic anthropology? And we, a journalist asked me that question, and we got down the list of board certified uh, forensic anthropologists, and it was about three to one. Three men to every woman. And then just for fun, we started looking at some of the other disciplines within the American Academy of Forensic Scientists. Dentistry, the forensic dentists were 99 to one. The forensic engineers, overwhelmingly uh, male versus female. So I think because anthropology is more of an academic-based forensic science, it's, it's, it's a little more gender friendly. You know, I, I, it's interesting because I often feel uncomfortable when I answer that question the same way because I don't recall realizing that I was facing an obstacle. Um, it for me is a time when I just power through it. I may not even recognize it to be an obstacle. It could be being stubborn. It could be just you know, freakishly focused on the end objective. I look back and I've heard uh, hallway conversations. Oh, well, it's a good thing they picked Kathy. That way there's a woman on the management team. Okay, those are, those are interesting and peak moments. So I, I've always um, done, I think, the same thing that Kathy's saying, which is I, I, I'm conscious of the fact that there are situations, whether I know it or not, where I am um, leading uh, on behalf of others, and I, so I try to do it really well. Whatever's put in front of me, I try to do it really well, and the way I've faced obstacles is to do the work better than anybody else in the moment. So uh, sometimes I think it's better when you don't see them because you don't allow yourself even that 10 seconds of victim strategy, you know, that 10 seconds of thought about being a victim, um, but uh, I know by the numbers that those obstacles exist. Uh, certainly I know by the stories of other people that I work with and live with that they exist, and uh, I just think we all get every chance, a, a, every day a chance to make the world a better place, and, and I, so I power through it. 
Unsinkable Molly Brown. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this this morning for whatever reason. I was just thinking, uh, uh, you know, I actually like the obstacle. I live for the obstacle because that's my challenge of the moment. And I'm much better in the challenge of the moment than I am in the long-term push. Other questions? Here. Hi, my name is Gada Ternani. I am a first year FMAP, but I was also a former participant in the ATP program. Um, my question is for Kathy Reichs. Um, have you, I know you're very busy producing bones, but have you given any thought to coming back to UNC Charlotte to sprinkling your knowledge again on the student body? I, I think about it now and then, teaching a course here or there, you mean, or? Yeah, yeah I mean, in, in any way. Yeah. yeah, I can't, I mean, I've just signed another two book contract, and uh, yeah, so it's not going to happen right away, but you know. <laughs> I don't know if there's any interest in that on their end, but. <laughs> well, I, I'm more expensive now than I was at the, in the early years. <laughs> well, we've got some trustees, a provost, a chancellor, a former chancellor. I bet you we can make that happen. Uh, you do, though, keep really great ties to Charlotte. I live here. I know that, but I'm saying. <laughs> but not everybody who lives here does. And, and you, you grew up, as you said, in Minnesota as well. What is it that, and you've been, again, all over the world, what is it that keeps your ties to Charlotte? What do you love about Charlotte? Oh, I just think Charlotte's a great place to live. Um, I love the climate. I haven't commuted to Quebec for many years. <laughs> it's a little colder there. Um, I love the, 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 it's a vibrant city. There's a lot going on in the city. There is the university. There is another, you know, there's a, a number of universities in the city. It's, it's become, when I first moved here, it was not, but it's become a wonderful restaurant city as well. There's always, we're, we're a major league sports city. And there's, there's just so much here going on, and yet it's relatively easy. Um, if you want to go to a play in New York, it's, it's complicated, and it's terribly... Here it's it, you know it's relatively easy. We we go to the symphony, we go to the basketball games, we go to the Panthers games, and you know I, it it works for me. Yeah, I also I agree with all those things, and I love Charlotte because what you invest into it is returned to you many times. And same thing is true with the university. What what a what a wonderful asset we have here. And if you haven't been out to the campus lately, um, you can't take the blue line for a few more months, sadly. But <laughs> That's, that was not a political comment, um, uh, but um, really, I, I'd encourage you. I'd encourage you to go. It's it is phenomenal, and you'll be blown away. And you will want to encourage um, other potential high school seniors to think about UNC Charlotte, even though it's close to home. It's a world away, and it's just oh, fantastic. Uh, all right, what else? Other questions? Right here. Jonathan Hill. I'm also a UNCC alum as well as ATP alum as well, uh, currently in the data organization for Bank of America. Uh, Kathy, I've heard you speak over the years several times. Uh, Kathy with a C, excuse me. Kathy with a K, first time I'm hearing you. Uh, but you guys have had some great illustrious careers, right? Some opportunities to really overcome some boundaries and, and obstacles and, of course, bring uh, your industry to the forefront. Uh, what's on the horizon, right? What, what are some things that you would love to be able to accomplish uh, before you know, you're, you're finished with your career? Wow, well, right now I'd just like to write these two books that are, <laughs> that are on the new uh, contract, and um, I don't know. You know, beyond those two, I'm not sure. Um, I have six grandchildren, all of a sudden. I had none, and then all of a sudden, it's like a litter. All of a sudden, <laughs> I've got six grandkids under the age of six. So I'm looking, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm looking forward to spending a lot more time with, with them. Uh, that's that's self-serving and, and selfish, but um, I am right now. That's kind of part of my future. Yeah, I, it, it, probably all of you, if you had to answer the, sa answer the same question, would answer the same way. I've got a management team meeting from 2 until 6 tonight, mm -hmm. two presentations in that discussion in front of my boss, and I'm just hoping not to screw them up. I mean, that, really, that is, that is the way of it, right? You, you put out there what is right in front of you. Uh, uh, I would, um, you know, I never intended to, I never knew I would. It's not that I never intended to. I never knew I would be a banker for 35 years. 
So, and I always thought I would go to law school, and sadly, I always thought, <laughs> given your, your family construct, I always thought I would be a litigator. Uh, I'm sure that's still open to me if that's what I wanted to do. So I'm, I'm very focused on doing what I do today very well, and then I'm confident um, because that's the way life works for people who work hard, like all of you, for people who are dedicated, who are open to thinking about things in new ways. I'm confident that the path will, um, will show itself. But I, will, I do have to say one thing. Uh, it is not the long in the tooth leaf pine award <laughs> or the end of life achievement award <laughs> this week. I get very nervous about those things. Um, so I, 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 part of the reason North Tryon is so important to me is that's going to be 10 years in the making and uh, uh, gives us a lot of great community development and redevelopment work to think about. Other questions? Okay, right over here. Uh, my name is Arian Avila. I'm with um, Think America Corporate Security. Um, you guys are very accomplished women in both of your careers. Absolutely rock stars to kind of hear you guys talk. I'm curious, you know, as a, as a mother of two young children, how do you also be rock stars at home? <laughs> Courtney? <laughs> We'd like you to answer that one. <laughs> Organization and discipline, I guess. I mean, you just have to organize your time. It's like when you're working full time, if, you know, two, two jobs, how do you write a novel? You just, you really have to break your day down as you were describing into blocks of time and be organized. And, and then the, the kids just blow the hell out of your whole organization. You know, it's, in, it's out the window. But yeah, what is the sign that secretaries often have on their desk? If you want something done right, give it to a busy person. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of the underpinnings of being a mom and working at outside the home at the same time. Yeah, I, I um, think in pri I think priorities are knowing your priorities and being convicted about them and being willing to do whatever it takes for your priorities to be your top priorities. Uh, it's not easy and the system doesn't always work to support it. Any career that you have will take 150% of you if that's what you want to or let it give you is my view. And so um, knowing your priorities and then some of you who work in the room in my organization know I gut check myself once a month. I do have a process for that too. I'll say at the beginning of the month, how did I do last month? Not to kick the hell out of myself, but to say what do I want to do differently? Do I need more family time, more civic time, more work time, more kid time? And the, the craziest thing of all is you think that when your kids are little, they're all consuming. As they get to be teenagers and older, they need more of your time. I actually think maternity leave should start like when they're 15 years old. <laughs> I do, I really do. I, um, you know, so, uh, so I, I, j I just think prioritization and a plan and then being honest with yourself in the mirror once in a while is, is my method. I would also say crock pot. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. <laughs> because the worst part of the day is when you've gathered them all back up and you're coming home at the end of the day and they all want your attention and they have to do homework. And when you open the door and come in and you smell dinner already done, crock pot. Yep. <laughs> and, and branding never hurts. My children think Kraft macaroni and cheese is, in fact, pasta. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> all right, there was a question right here in the middle, right here. Hi, my name is Yev Nikitin. I also represent the Plaque Technology Program. And uh, one question I had was more for uh, Kathy with the K. You talked about like the main theme was just discipline. You just, you're just chugging away, creating what you're creating. But can you talk about like the inception of those ideas? How do you come up with things? Do you have a process of, do you draw on your past experiences? How do you draw on your past experiences to create something new? I do draw on my past experiences. Each of the books um, is based on something I've, you, in the early books it was based on a specific case. The first book is based on a serial murder case I worked on. Um, the second book is based on, we did the autopsy for the Order of the Solar Temple, the cult that killed themselves and killed each other in, in uh, Quebec and also in uh, France back in the 90s. Um, the the third book is based on the human rights work in Guatemala. The fourth book is based on a, it's an airline crash, so it's based on disaster recovery work. Each one of them 
I won't go through every single one. <laughs> Don't panic. Um, and, and I start, as I said earlier, with that just that central idea, that central theme. What's this one little sliver, this thread that might be of interest? And then you, you ask yourself, well, okay, what if this happened? And what if that happened? And what if, and you just spin it off into, into fiction. Um, names. I name my characters based, uh, I have my central core, they already have their names, but uh, based on geographic appropriateness, cultural, ethnic appropriateness. I usually what I do is if I'm naming a character who's an elderly woman in whatever Charleston, I get the obituaries and I go through the Charleston Post and Courier ob obituaries and I find one name from here and one name from here and I combine them together and then I check to be sure it's not a real person on Google and that's often how I come up with, with names for characters. All right. Um, I'm going to ask the last question, and then Phil, I'm coming right back to you. So you've had, you've been asked for advice once before. Um, when, but this is a little bit different than advice. When you think about um, what you want a set of people, many of most of whom have never met you before, when you think about what you hope they'll take away about your purpose and your meaning and what's important to you, what what would you, if you were headlining it for them, what would you say? Oh wow, that's hard. Um, in what capacity? You know, in the capacity of a novelist? Sure, or anything. The bottom line is a good story. When people want, when people pick up a novel, they want to read a good story. So that, that hopefully they say she, she told a good story and she wrote it well. Um, as a scientist, you want to be correct. You want to, your, both your, your approach, your protocol, your carrying through of that protocol and your final conclusions to be correct and have the impact that, it doesn't matter what that impact is, whether you're helping the prosecution, helping the defense, whatever, you just want to be correct and you want to have contributed to justice. It sounds like a, a cliche, yeah. but. Love it. Well, um, I would say the speaker series that we're proud to be a part of with UNC Charlotte is off to the perfect start. Honestly, there is no better guest um, to, to be part of the launch of this effort, uh, Kathy, than you. And thank you for what you, um, your connection to UNC Charlotte. Thank you for um, inspiring us uh, uh, with your scientific disciplines and for entertaining us and making us understand what's possible in the creative work that you do. Really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, thank Kathy you. Kathy Wright. Thank you all for being here. We're going to invite you to go out to the Bank of America atrium and finish off the food. But uh, thank you to the two Cathy's for being here today. It was great to see the launch of your television career as a t talk show uh, host in the future after banking is done. Uh, I'm sorry it was a little cold in here, but it was actually it was actually quite intentional in honor of Kathy Reichs. We didn't want your next book to decompose. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, now you'll remember that, okay. So uh, let me also finally thank again Kathy Bassana and Charles Bowman and the bank for this tremendous gift. Uh, when we went to Charles and Kathy to s talk about the data science initiative at UNC Charlotte, they were instantly into it and understood the importance of building th this capacity at the university and building upon the experience we've had with the Bank of America chair that had been filled by Bill Rabarsky, uh, and now moving on to this next chair, uh, it's gonna be a tremendous opportunity. So thank you all for being here.